In this module, we're continuing to learn more about the classification and naming of plants. By the end of this unit, you'll be able to outline the procedure for naming newly discovered, naturally occurring plants. You'll be able to describe the difference between the species subtaxa, subspecies, form, and variety. And you'll know how to look up the etymology of plant names. You may remember that in the last module, we talked about the increasing numbers of plants being described and named in Western Europe in the 19th century. And confusion started to arise because sometimes the same plant was given different names by different people. In order to remedy this problem, an international meeting of botanists was convened in Paris in 1867 in order to establish international rules governing the naming of plants. The plant names in Linnaeus's Species Plantarum were adopted as the official starting point, and one of the new rules established was the rule of priority. This meant that the accepted name of a plant would be the first one that was applied. For example, let's say that one person discovered a plant in 1890 and called it by one name, and then somebody else a few years later discovered it again and gave it another name. When it's realized that the two plants are actually the same species, the rule of priority dictates that the first name that was published is the one that's retained, and that becomes the accepted name for the species. If you discover an unnamed plant in the wild, you have the privilege of naming it. In addition, your name as the discoverer of the plant is recognized as part of the full plant name when it's written out in its entirety. For example, in 1992, a previously unknown California native shrub was discovered in Northern California. It was identified as belonging to the existing genus Nebiusia and was given the specific epithet Cliftonii to honor one of its discoverers, G. L. Clifton. If we were to write out the name of this shrub in its entirety, we would write Nebiusia cliftonii, Shevok, Erta, and D. W. Taylor. The three names appearing after the species name acknowledge the people who first officially described this plant, James Shevok, Barbara Erta, and Dean Taylor. A plant name is usually only written out in its entirety like this in, in scientific papers and botanical literature, but it's something you may come across and it's important to know why these names appear and what they mean. Linnaeus named so many plants that usually only his initial L appears after the species name. In order for the name of your newly discovered plant to be recognized, you have to publish a complete description of the plant in English in a peer-reviewed, widely circulated journal. On the right, you can see the first page of the description of Nebiusia cliftonii that was submitted to the journal Novon that's published by the Missouri Botanical Garden. And finally, you also have to deposit an annotated specimen of the plant in a herbarium to which the public has access. Our local herbariums include one at the UCSC Arboretum and the Jepson Herbarium at UC Berkeley. This herbarium specimen is then referred to as the type specimen. The herbarium specimens serve as reference points for botanical nomenclature and research, and they can last for many years when they're stored correctly. The photo on the right shows an annotated herbarium specimen at the Royal Horticultural Society in England of a lavender that was collected in 1731. This photo was taken just four years ago when I was last visiting the RHS garden in England. Most herbariums these days are working on digitizing their herbarium collections in order to preserve them in a different format and so that greater access can be given to them. As mentioned in an earlier unit, since the late 19th century, plant classification has been organized as a pyramidal hierarchy. At the bottom of the hierarchy, species with similar characteristics are ordered into a genus. And remember that the plural of genus is genera. Genera 
with similar characteristics are ordered into lesser numbers of families, and families with similar characteristics are ordered into lesser numbers of orders, and so on, all the way up to kingdom. Each of these hierarchical levels is referred to as a taxon, and the plural of taxon is taxa. This word is derived from the Greek word taxis, meaning arrangement. The International Code of Nomenclature for Algae, Fungi and Plants sets out rules for the naming of each of the taxa. In this class, we're mainly concerned only with taxa lower than family. All family names end in ACE, which is pronounced as if you were spelling out the word ACE, so A-C-E. So we have the Lamiaceae. Most of the families also have English names. For example, the Lamiaceae is the mint family, Asteraceae is the sunflower family, Fabiaceae is the pea family, and Cannabaceae is the cannabis family. As you can see from the table on the right, each of the taxa can vary hugely in size. The sunflower family, the Asteraceae, is the largest family in the world, with about 32,000 species in it. The ginkgo family has just one species, ginkgo biloba, the ginkgo tree. Plant species in the wild can show variation in physical characteristics, both within a population and between different populations. Small variations in characteristics within a plant species can result in taxonomists using subclassifications of species, such as subspecies, variety, and form. Subspecies is usually applied to plants from geographically separate populations that have slightly different phenotypes. Subspecies is often used interchangeably by, ta by taxonomists with variety. When you're writing subspecies in a plant name, you can abbreviate the word to SSP with a period after it or subsp with a period after it. Using SSP can easily be confused with the way in which the plural of the word species is abbreviated. That's SPP. So you might find it better to write subsp in order to avoid confusion. Variety, or the Latin word varietas, are also applied to small physical differences within a species. And the, differences, and the differences are usually not quite as big as those which warrant the use of subspecies. Variety is usually abbreviated to var, and we shouldn't confuse the botanical use of variety with the way in which this word is often used to refer to cultivated varieties in horticulture and agriculture. An example of a variety is the plant Cotyledon orbiculata variety spuria. And finally, form, or the Latin word forma, are used to, di to distinguish plants that have very small physical differences, perhaps a slightly different flower color or shape or growth habit. Form is usually abbreviated to just F when we're writing it. For example, Rosa rugosa F alba or Rosa rugosa forma alba. In the next slide, we'll be mentioning the California native subshrub Monadella villosa, which is coyote mint. This is a photo of what the plant looks like, so you have a visual of it before going into the next slide. Monadella villosa is a loosely mounding to spreading subshrub with evergreen to semi-evergreen foliage that is aromatic and smells minty when it's bruised. Rounded clusters of small lavender flowers bloom at the tips of upright leafy stems in late spring through early midsummer. It provides pollen and nectar for bees, nectar for butterflies, and is a great beneficial insect plant. The differences in plant characteristics that warrant the use of the species subtaxa, subspecies variety and form, appear to be really, really small. So are they really that important? 
Well, they may be important if you're trying to exactly match an existing planting of that species. Perhaps a plant has died in a mass planting that was done with a particular plant. And it could look really obvious if you don't replace the dead plant with one that's the same subspecies or variety as the others. Subtaxa are, are particularly important in habitat restoration and revegetation programs. Using the same subtaxon as existing populations, preferably by collecting seed or cuttings locally from those local populations, maintains the genetic integrity of the local gene pool. In a revegetation pro project, there may also be other organisms that have co-evolved with a specific subspecies or variety. And it's possible you may be excluding those organisms if you don't use the right subtaxa for the project. And finally, subtaxa can be important if you're working with a client who would like only locally native plants in their landscape. In the table on the right, you can see a comparison of two of the physical characteristics and the range of three subspecies of the California native subshrub coyote mint, Monadella villosa. You can see that there are slight differences in flower color between the subspecies abispoensis and subspecies villosa. There are also slight differences in the size of the flower cluster between the three subspecies. It's possible, though I don't know for sure, that these differences may be associated with the pollinators of these plants within their native range. So by planting the wrong subspecies, you may be planting a plant with flowers that are not accessible to a particular pollinator. Let's talk now about the meaning of Latin names. There's a lot of memorization in this class and botanical names can be hard to learn. But I think that the learning process is a little easier when we know that the Latin names do have a meaning and can tell us something useful about the plant. Latin may be a dead language, but there, there are many English words that have Latin roots and Spanish, Italian and French are all Latin based languages. So we can use any knowledge we have of these language languages sometimes to help us understand what the plant names mean and to help us remember them. Let's go through some of the main points about the Latin names. So genus and specific epithets are derived from many different sources. Sometimes they come from Greek or Roman mythology, like the genus names Narcissus and Hyacinthus. The genus may be a combination of two or more Greek words, for example, leucodendron and leucanthemum. Luke is derived from the Greek word for white, dendron is derived from the Greek word for tree, and anthemum from the Greek for flower. The first leucodendron, a cone bush, to be described ever, was leucodendron argentium, which is a large shrub or small tree with silvery or white foliage. Leucanthemum, meaning white flower, is the name applied to a genus of daisies, all with white flowers. Sometimes the genus or specific epithet honors a historic figure, a botanist, a plant hunter, or perhaps somebody's spouse. Specific epithets are often an adjective describing a physical characteristic of a plant. For example, alba, means white, rubescens means rosy red, and albotomentosa means white and hairy. The specific epithet may describe the geographic origin of a plant. For example, sinensis means Chinese or from China, japonica means Japanese, and hespero means Western. To find out what the etymology of the Latin binomial is, Google it. Google the genus and the specific epithet separately and also include etymology and plant name as two of your search words. For example, if you're wanting to find out the etymology of the genus name Grevillea, enter Grevillea, etymology, 
plan name as your search words. In Canvas, you'll find a short list of websites that I found that are really good resources for looking up the etymology of Latin plant names. Let's summarize now what we've covered in this unit. The discoverer of a previously undescribed naturally occurring plant found in the wild has the privilege of naming the plant. The discoverer must publish a description of the new plant in a peer reviewed journal and submit an annotated specimen to a herbarium that is open to the public. This specimen becomes known as the type specimen. Since the late 19th century, plants have been classified into taxa using a hierarchical system. Rules governing these taxa are maintained by the International Association of Plant Taxonomy and codified in the International Code of Botanical Nomenclature for algae, fungi and plants. Plant family names always end in ACE. Species can be classified or subclassified rather into subspecies, variety or form, according to relatively small physical differences. The botanical or scientific names of plants are in a dead language, Latin, but they do have meanings and can always tell us something interesting or useful about a plant.